Muchas gracias. Uh, todavía es... Thank you. You're still here? I thought I'd be walking into an empty room, so thanks for sticking around and thanks for your patience. I will switch back to English for you, so as not to get too confused. Invitation. Um, as um, our dear colleague, colleague William said already, that th has said thank you for the fantastic food, for the environment, and for you people. But when it comes to food, I think he forgot about some very important aspects that the fantastic food you can trust only because it has been produced in a lively soil, in a functioning soil. And I show now the first picture, um, which uh, gives just a short glimpse what it's all about when we talk about these enormous organic resources we have in our environment and we are producing specifically in the concentrated urban areas and also in our islands here with two million people. Um, it is all about what we heard in the first introduction uh, of the organizers of this international conference that we have to uh, have the vision and the idea to recycle the resources we take out from the nature to the design of the products or towards our um, economic environment back to the nature. And what is the basis where all comes from besides the energy from, uh, from the sun? It is the soil at the end. It's the biosphere which produces the energy for all what we live of. Um, and the key to the functioning of this basis of life, rather than the basis of life is we heard at school, chemistry, physics, and my par paradigm is the basis of life is humus. Humus is the basis of life, and this depends on the biodiversity. And this, the whole society, not only our dear farmers and horticulturists, and home gardeners have to take care of, we have to take common responsibility. And this is more, maybe the focus which goes through my presentation. All we know is that this resource has an, uh, is an enormous fraction, not only in municipal and household waste. I will show you amazing figures how much organic resources we produce. But whenever it is mixed into our mixed and residual waste bin, it loses its quality, its usability, its recyclability, and therefore it loses its markets. You might be familiar with the figures. It is approximately between 30 and more than 50, 55 percent of municipal and household waste. So it's the major fraction. This is equivalent to 190 up to 250 kilograms per inhabitant per year. It depends on the region, on the urbanization, on the um, uh, food and elementary eating habits and behavior and tradition in the certain uh, environments, and also uh, the maintenance of parks and gardens, etc. When we leave it in residual waste, it causes enormous problems even in managing residual waste. I can tell you one example of the Black Sea in Varna in Bulgaria. They have built one of the most modern mechanical, biological, and even recycling MBR3 um, uh, plants there. But they did not consider that the composition of the waste in a coastal a region with a lot of touristic activities is completely different than the one of the residual waste in Germany. And they had, in, during the summer, they have 70% of food waste in the mixed waste they collect. And therefore, the entire recycling and also biological treatment of this MBT plant was completely, more or less closed down, didn't function. They recycled 1% of the dry recyclables and the biological process uh, broke down because they didn't have any structure material. So these are the aspects to have to be considered. That separate collection is most important. And we see it also in terms of quality, left mixed waste compost, which leads to a mixed, uh, mixed waste 
collection, composting, or biological treatment, which leads to something like a broken down Christmas tree, glimmering and glooming. I should have taken a picture in the night with some um, UV flashlight on it. And on the right side, you have separate collection, completely clean, less than 1% of impurities in the compost, and it finds all the markets uh, where uh, it is um, required. Um, there is one very important uh, aspect uh, in the competitive discussion between mass incineration, MBT, composting, mixed waste composting, composting of source separated material and anaerobic digestion. And one issue is just the capital expenditures, the investment you need, specific investment you need for an incinerator is around yeah, 1,000 euros per ton. Goes a little bit down to a MBT plant, depending of course of the size and the facilities and the devices included there. But then it's dramatically close to 10%, 10 to 20% in composting. So this is the key saving also when it comes to operational costs, which you see on that side, um, that for composting, in average, the cost, the operational costs are between 35 and 65 euros per ton. This is Austrian experience, but it's quite similar to other situations, depending on the scale and the type of technology you use. Uh, anaerobic, does it work here? Yeah. Anaerobic digestion, make it like that. Anaerobic digestion is a little bit more expensive, um, but, uh, 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 but you see also here, now based on the overcapacity in former times, in just five, six years ago, incineration in Austria uh, was charged, the gate fee was around 170, 150 euros per ton, now it is down to 80 because of the overcapacity and new contracting. So these are also economic uh, arguments we have to take into account beside the EU regulations and the Waste Framework Directive uh, commitments which are likely to come that source separation and biological treatment will be a must. Um, this is what you can achieve as regards the diversion targets, the diversion of biodegradable waste from landfills, which, as you know, is 65 percent uh, based on the 1995 production or landfilling of biodegradable material. And if you look at that, this is the result within only one year when separate collection of food waste and garden waste was introduced here in a village with approximately, I think it was five to 8,000 inhabitants. The reduction was overall by 270 kilogram per household. This equals 73% reduction of biodegradable waste just by introducing porta a porta door to door collection of food waste and garden waste. So within one year, the requirements of the landfill directors for the evasion of biodegradable waste is achieved um, and also the quality of the residual waste is improved in order to achieve higher recycling in the mechanical treatment. I give you now an example which might be something of interest even for an island or for many rural areas or even any area because I will show you some of the city and uh, an example from rural areas how separate collection composting was implemented in Austria. Um, you see these white dots, these are all composting plants, approximately more than 400 composting plants. Um, what is most interesting that they have installed more or less now exactly the capacity of the separately collected waste. They are nearly full at the moment with an average capacity, and this is already an indication how decentralized and local composting, separate collection of composting was implemented of approximately 3,000 tons. The average composting plant size and capacity in Germany is between 20 and 30,000 tons. In the Netherlands, nearly 80,000 to 100,000 tons. The big industrial facilities which need also a professional marketing department in order to market and sell their material. 
Every 20,000 inhabitants serve one composting plant in average. So where to, which direction is the best one, you advise? And I will give you now uh, an example from Upper Austria, where the average size of the composting plants, quite a rural area, with 180 recycling centers, 160 composting plants for 1.5 million inhabitants. The average size of the composting plants is only 1,000 tons. And this is a cooperation between uh, farmers and municipalities. Here are the typical collection tools they have provided. This is paper bags or uh, little, these paper bags or the buckets, biodegradable buckets, which you I think you know it also here from the island project, and the bigger buckets here for the restaurants and for the shops, and the big paper bags with, I think it's 100 liters approximately, for fine garden waste if they, uh, the households do not home composting, they can put the paper bags also on the street uh, for delivering their surplus garden waste. Um, this is how the farmers do the collection. We have heard, we have had a presentation about gender in waste management. You see here the perfect um, um, share of equal work, not completely equal between the farmers uh, couple. As always, the farmer drives the tractor and has a good time and his lady, always smiling, always happy, is doing the work. Yeah? <laughs> So uh, we can discuss this with your farmer's family a little bit later. Uh, but what you see here is the farmer earn also the money for the collection service in these rural areas. And this can be done also as a service of a farmer, for instance, for a hotel or for a tourist resort. Why not? All he would need is to have a proper vehicle, a proper collection tool, and a proper uh, 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 system for for the buckets and the containers that are used and would not create any nuisance. Here are some other examples where they use the lifter systems, all constructed more or less in cooperation with local workshops with the municipality and the farmers. And in addition to the food waste and door-to-door -door collection, uh, they have been implemented um, not with a distance of not more than five kilometers for each household to drive these recycling centers and specifically uh, the tipping or the bring points for garden waste. Um, and the, these are frequent with clear opening hours, with a fence, with signs, so that you don't have illegal dumping of refrigerators or tires or whatever. So the material is completely clean, zero impurities. And in the former times, we had also such situations. This has to, of course, to be prevented in order um, yeah, I, I think it's without words. I don't need to explain this. Um, and this is the, such a typical agricultural small-scale composting plant, treating food waste as well as garden waste, um, having here his tipping area, pre-mixing the composting site, uh, the windrow turner, and the storage for the ready-made compost, mix with uh, producing some substrates for direct use and also um, uh, 100 percent compost for the agricultural use. And all this was possible because it was based on a decision on the provincial governments, in this case for these 1.6 million inhabitants, provincial government um, in combination with uh, the waste management intermunicipal uh, association, uh, um, uh, which covers approximately between 20 and 60 small municipalities. A similar example we have seen from Mallorca before, where they cooperate, uh, the farmers and the muni uh, single municipality itself, they were co-financing the machines, the design, the construction, the collection truck, the shredder, one shredder for the entire region, and also one screening machine for the entire region, which is traveling from composting plant to composting plant as it is needed. 
This is another example of the city of Graz. There you have a city with approximately 300,000 inhabitants, uh, 100,000 households, um, and uh, what is uh, the collection of biobin is done door-to-door uh, -door collection, yeah, uh, with a participation rate of approximately 66%. That means 44, uh, 43, th so, sorry. 34% uh, of the population are garden owners which are performing home composting only. And this is controlled by the municipality because they are obliged to use the bio bin and have actively to um, uh, ask the municipality to be exempted from the use of the bio bin. They are controlled and then they receive a reduction of the overall yearly waste fee. So there is a certain incentive here. And you have the typical performance for an urban environment with approximately 90% of bio waste, mainly food based, but also including some of fine garden waste. Green waste 30 kilogram, because this is mainly also um, home composted in those who, uh, um, households who have a bio bin for a separate collection. So total 120 kilogram is quite a common um, achievement in full scale separate collection of bio waste in urban areas. And this uh, is how they they do it. Um, here you have the city oh. around the corner, you have the city of Graz, and they do the entire collection of the 34,000 tons of green waste and kitchen waste. They prepare it, they clean it, pre-screen it, um, mix it in the right way for composting, and then distribute it to 19 different farmers in the environment of the city of Graz, who have a special contract with the city of Graz. And they perform the composting. So it is delivered to the farmers. And here you see the composting plants, the turner, and here all the different farmers who, depending on the size and the individual contracts, treat different amounts uh, of the bio-waste. And until they receive a positive test report, analytical test report, that the compost is applicable and fulfills the uh, quality requirements to be used and the standards to be used in agriculture, the compost on the plants remains in the property of the city. So the farmer is protected from res because he's not res uh, uh, responsible for the pretreatment and mixing. Yeah? The farmer is protected from achieving a material which would be not suited. So it's very profitable for the farmers. Usually the tipping fee or the gate fee for bio waste in Austria is between 45 and 65 euros per ton. Um, in this case, here you see the price is a little bit lower because they have much less risk and they don't need to maintain a shredder, etc. in the pretreatment. But still, it's a good profit for the farmers and they have 80% of the compost is used on their own farms. So I jump into the, the humus issue. And I, I think during the last, I would say, nearly century, uh, our concept, our paradigm, how to um, f feed yeah, uh, the human race from the moment we detected that mineral elements are important to provide plant growth. So the mineral theory um, uh, that was um, invented or put in place by, by Liebig in the, last, in, the, in the 19th century led to the idea that the mineral elements and trace elements mainly produce the plants. Now we know it's the microbiology in the soil, that even every element has to go through a microbiological process through the entire soil biota, and to, to have the sufficient functioning, biological functioning of our soils depends on the habitat, that they find a living environment, and the living environment is only uh, created by the formation of clay humus complexes. This is humus, this is soil formation. It's a very simple issue. So when we talk within the circular economy even, and 
based on the idea of the fertilizer regulation, including the recycling of the organic resources and to manage our phosphor scarcity and, and so forth. Um, my idea would rather be rather to talk about nutrient efficiency, to talk about humus efficiency as an intermediate step to achieve nutrient and plant performance and plant health efficiency in the long run. And the reason is, here's just two examples. 25% of the exudates, of the assimilates that are produced by the plants are provided to the root environment, to the root sphere, means to the symbiotic living microbiota in the soil. So it's not used by the plants direct, they assimilate. It's directly fed to the symbiotic microbiological community. And we have to take into account that in, also in the root sphere, there are 50 times higher colonization of um, uh, uh, microbiological community, bacteria and fungi, and, um, uh, uh, and also um, uh, small animals, um, providing uh, the nutrients to the plants again, back again. And in order to have this functioning, this biological functioning, we have to create um, our, our, um, our, the soil habitat, which works mainly through the pores. Though the pore space and the system of pores in the soil is the most important. And what I want to show you here, I think is most interesting, because it shows the, um, sufficient, the, the active surface in square meter per gram of the different solid soil fractions in the soil. Percent is less than 0.1. Loam material yeah, is about up to one uh, uh, square meter per gram. Then biochar, which is considered as the new um, saving agent for our soil fertility and a long-lasting carbon source for our soils and humus formation soils is 150 to 300. Then you have clay, then you have soil in principle, but the highest surface, active surface, where the microbial community and microbes can settle, can colonize, is definitely for humified organic matter. So not fresh organic matter, not particulate organic matter, but clay humus complexes. And this is all the idea what you see in the picture below. These are just electronics, uh, microscopic um, picture of the, of the soil here. And here you have a ready-made compost, again, under and here under a microscope, um, which is an aggregation which is resilient against drought and resilient against heavy rainfalls and flooding. Uh, the application of mature compost is very efficient. Here you see a 20 years lasting field trial, which is just an example of many field trials that have been performed in many places all over the world. And what you see here, this is 5 tons, 10 tons, and 40 tons of compost every year. Here you have only mineral fertilizer with different levels of nitrogen applied. And here, the red one, you have a combination of compost and mineral fertilizer. And what is so amazing, only where you apply only organic fertilization with matured compost, you achieve a constant increase um, and maintenance and increase of the soil organic carbon in your soil. And I will show you in the next picture, um, should be shown also here. Um, this is the carbon balance. This means, the, uh, in that case, the humus balance in kilogram per carbon and year that only with a typical application rate, which are these two, with 20 to 14 tons per hectare, you achieve a positive balance or a equilibrium, we could say, because usually we lose between 400 and 1,000 kilogram carbon per hectare due to our um, land use and land management and, and soil management. And this is exactly balanced, or we achieve even an increase here with the higher application. 
And if we go into the climate aspect, so the net CO2 sequestration or emission, only with the pure uh, compost application, we can achieve a net CO2 sequestration. This is just one example, and they are repeated in many uh, situations. Now, what is important for composting, and this already leads me to my final loop in this presentation. Um, there are many composting plants all over the world, but the knowledge, how, how many time do I have left? One, two. So, the knowledge about composting in order to provide an effective humus, clay humus fertilizer is very, very important. And this is shown here that you have one industrial compost with many still particulate organic matter, which is not mature, which would degrade uncontrolled in the soil. And this is stable clay organic, um, uh, organic particles and aggregates. And even in small scale composting, after two days of not managing it, you see you have a complete chaos in fungal growth, uh, it is dried out, it has a wet uh, uh, bottom tone, and only this one, which was managed every day, very regularly, watered, turned, aerated, you have a homogeneous development of the composting process, and therefore on the build-up of clay humus complexes. I just show you, even in very small-scale situations, if you leave out two days, you have a complete chaos because the biological activity in such a heap of organic matter is dramatic. Yeah? It's completely chaotic. So if you put this in a reactor and take it out after 10 days, even with aeration and some watering, you lose control of an efficient production of high quality products. And this is the main problem of closed reactor system. I won't now go into a basic handbook on proper composting, but I just tell you this is the most important that all composting, the operators of composting plant have to go through through a very practical, at least two weeks exercise learning how to do the job and uh, getting really an in-depth insight. And I, I tell you, the main, and the most important is uh, the water management. Uh, the coverage with this fleece uh, reduces even 70% of the order uh, potential, uh, which is very important due to the condensation project, because sometimes it is said open vitro composting can't be done in the neighborhood of uh, any residential areas. It can be done, but you have to know your job. Um, composting can be done in all scales. I just want to mention two, two aspects. Hygienization. This is just one short mes message. Uh, those who are familiar with the animal byproducts regulation might consider that the composting of catering waste and the food waste is only allowed in uh, closed systems. This is not true. If you read the animal byproducts regulation carefully for catering waste, even if it's composted with some other material can be still done in open vintro composting as long as you provide that the certain temperature regime is um, followed for the entire, for the uh, intensive process. Mm, and you can establish national rules for the time temperature regimes, just as a short remark for those who are involved in, in those areas. Control systems quality management systems that you follow a certain regime not to mix up fresh materials with mature materials is a standard and a quality assurance and quality management scheme with a very precise documentation of each steps in your composting plant not only helps to show the authority that you have done everything in a proper way uh, but also helps yourself to um, understand your process windrow by windrow, compost by compost, you use and don't make any mistake. Education, training is key, and I'll show you just some examples. Uh, composting can be done in any climate, under any circumstances, where is the good understanding about the biology and the final product that what you want to achieve. Here in Mexico, these are pictures of Urs Hildebrandt, who has established these systems all over the world with uh, even the savanna in Kenya, Uzbekistan, with unemployed Roma and Sinti people, works perfectly. 
with all types of materials. Muchas gracias and uh, yeah. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much. Mr. Amlinger, thank you very much for that presentation. We now have time for one question th from our Twitter st uh, stream. You are asked whether you know any island in the world that uses the strategy of optimization for uh, organic waste as an organic waste strategy. Actually, uh, I have to ask perhaps Francesc. I don't know a specific island, but I still... Oh, I have to speak here. Uh, I don't know a specific island, but I don't think that we should make a difference between an island and a continent, because all continents are, in the end, also islands. Thank you very much. Final question. Final question from Agustin Riera. Can calcium sulfate improve composting? Calcium sulfate, can it improve composting? Um, we, we, we have experienced that in some areas, due to the new filter systems in our incineration and combustion um, boilers and facilities, that sulfate is a minimum factor uh, in our soils. So with this you can add um, uh, and, and the second aspect is that you reduce the pH value in the compost. And for certain uses, a lower, uh, usually compost has a pH uh, between 7.5 and sometimes above 8. And this might be a problem for substrates for sensitive plants regarding high pH values. So for this specific purposes, yes. And for um, soil applications with a lack or a deficiency in sulfur, uh, it might be used. But otherwise, <coughs> rather use clay soil and already produced compost to balance the process and to increase the stabilization of the humic uh, substance formation. <laughs>